All right, so let's let's go ahead and get started on, on this part here. And um, uh, basically, I, I just want to describe why the, the Galilean transformations end up being a little bit problematic if you want to view things that are a little bit like outside the scope of what physicists had, had kind of typically thought about, you know, back in like the mid 1800s, for example. And so the basic the, the basic idea is that um, if, if Galilean transformations hold, you know, if you have someone who is moving, presumably they're moving through space. And there, there's some stationary reference frame that you, you can identify, which will help you calculate like everyone else's velocity relative to your own. So you have some particular reference frame. If Galilean, tra uh, Galilean transformations uh, are appropriate for the universe, things should work out, basically. And here's one um, the experiment that showed maybe not. And so specifically, what what they did, and, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more, but every year we go around the sun. Now we're at a distance of however many, you know, millions of miles. Uh, it's one AU is the distance we're at. Um, 10 trillion kilometers or something like that. Um, and so here's Earth. And we're moving at, you know, a velocity in the tens of thousands of miles per hour around the sun. Like it's, it's something that's, you know, completely unrealistic to be uh, moving on Earth. But because the distance we have to cover every year is so vast, we just have, literally, it's an astronom astronomically large speed that we're going through. So we're moving through space here at some speed v. That's, again, it's not a small value. And then way up here in the distance, there is some star that, you know, might be, you know, 100 light years away or whatever. And it's shining down light. And we knew at this point, in the early 1900s, um, late 1800s, uh, 1887, I think is when this was done, this experiment, 87, 97. Um, we knew at that point, Maxwell's theory of light told us that light travels in waves as propagations in the electric and the magnetic fields. But the, the, that wave that is traveling, uh, uh, he had predicted, uh, Maxwell predicted, travels at a certain velocity c. So we have some velocity c that light's traveling through the universe. And that's, that, that little part that I include there is kind of important. The light is traveling through the universe at a velocity c. Earth is traveling through the universe at a velocity v. Do you see where we have a, a bit of an issue here? All of a sudden, if light's coming here at a certain speed, and if we're approaching it. Now, we're not coming at like at 50% speed of light, but even at, you know, let's say we're going 5% the speed of light, which is still much, much greater than our actual velocity. But if we're coming at it at 5% the speed of light, how are we going to observe that here on Earth? Are we... Hi, Lenny. <laughs> Sorry, my dog's coming out of the room. Um, but th th that was a really important question, though. If we're actually going towards the source, are we now going to view that photon of light? or we didn't know that word at the, turn, at the time, so I shouldn't use it, are we going to view that wave of light as, ha as having a slower velocity or a faster velocity, more specifically, in this case? And Galilean transformations predict that should happen. So specifically, the observed speed. Now, if we view our reference frame here, S prime, as moving, if we now view this as moving with some velocity v, so we view a co-moving reference frame along with Earth. How fast should we see that, that light coming at us? And in this case here, it's as if, so if you think about like you approaching a car, if there's a car coming at you at, let's say 50 miles an hour, you're coming at that car at 50 miles an hour. You're gonna co come at each other as if you're traveling relatively 100 miles an hour. I, I hope that's pretty clear if you work that out. So in this case here, if we're approaching that, that star at a speed of V, and if the light is approaching us at, at a speed of C, what we would predict is that C prime, more specifically the speed of light in our frame S prime. The speed that we would observe that wave of light to be coming at us with should in fact be equal to C plus V. Because both of these, V and C, were calculated in reference to our original frame, which I didn't even bother drawing because it was so kind of assumed 
but let's do it anyway. We have a frame S relative to the sun. Or maybe relative to something that's even more, you know, fundamental. But this tells us something is really weird. Because if the speed of light in S, S prime is different than the speed, the speed of light in S. If those two things are separate, physics breaks. It's a big deal. Because we knew previously that if, according to Maxwell's equations, those, well, okay, okay, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, let, let, let's not, let's go, not go that, down that route. But this is the prediction that Galilean transformations make. And this is exactly what Mickelson and Morley had set up to do. The Mickelson-Morley experiment. Hi, Lenny. How you doing, bud? Um, set out to test this. So they're asking, is C prime not equal to C? And again, if we go back in, in, in the day, it's reasonable to, to question whether the, the, wave of, the waves of light might be going at a different speed. For example, if you're you know, on the ocean, if you're a buoy in the, on the ocean, you see the waves coming at you at a certain speed. If you're on a speedboat coming at those waves, you're gonna see them at a different speed. So it's reasonable to assume, given the wave nature of light, that if there is a basic medium uh, that, the, that the waves travel through, if the universe is composed of some physical medium that light waves travel through, specifically, then there must be some preferred reference frame where you are motionless relative to that fundamental medium. Now, they call that the ether. The um, So, I'll write that here in a second. But... The question they're asking is, does that fundamental medium exist? Or does that ether exist? Does the ether, or you might see it spelled um, A-E-T-H-E-R, exist? So that's what this experiment set out to answer. And... Again, the idea is that if you can measure that, you know, if you're approaching a source, if the speed of light appears to be faster, what that means is there is a fundamental medium that you attached to planet Earth is traveling through. That the, the speed of light had been measured to the, the, the stationary frame, and we're also moving relative to that fundamental stationary frame. If our results show that, as this predicts, we see the speed of light faster when we're moving towards the star, then everything works. And spe more specifically, there is a fundamental reference frame. That's what that ether kind of indicates now, that there is a fundamentally correct reference frame at which everything should else, uh, else should be viewed from. Now, real quickly, I'll sketch out how this was done, and this is where I'm going to refer you to uh, the, the, the more in-depth video by Caltech back in the 80s, which I think was a really good uh, reproduction of how the history of it is as well. But let's say, that, let's say the waves of light are coming here. So Morley used an interferometer. And what that means is that you want to separate that original incoming wave of light into two separate waves so that they can interfere with each other. That's literally what it means. And so specifically, he made a mirror here, and at least it's, it's a semi-transparent mirror with, with a known reflectivity. So in theory, you can allow 50% of the light to, to pass through and 50% of the light to, to reflect. So half of it went this way here, half of it went this way here. And then down here, equally spaced, and this is really important, he put two other mirrors. So let's switch colors. So if those mirrors are each spaced the same distance from the original separating mirror, what happens is the light bounces off, it comes back, the light bounces off, it comes back. And then now at this point, because it has the same reflectivity as before, half of that is going to be transmitted forwards, half of this is going to reflect back, and so these two things should combine and produce some outgoing beam of light. So 
So I, I hope that makes sense what's happening there. You're, we're, we're losing half the signal at each interface other than that and that. But so it separates and they come back together. Now, if the light waves are traveling at the same speed, specifically, if light is not a different speed in the y direction than x, it should take exactly the same amount of time to get to the ends and back. But if this is attached to the Earth at, like, at, at exactly there, if we're traveling towards that star in this direction here, what that means is that the light in this direction, as it continues going in the y direction here, very well might be traveling at, for example, a faster speed than it is there. Or as it goes forward, then as it tries to rebound, it has to basically catch back up because we're already moving relative to the ether. So here's the basic idea. If the ether does not exist, if there is no fundamental frame, these two things should perfectly cancel out or they might perfectly constructively interfere. But that was not what was expected. What we had expected was that because of the ether, the time it takes to make this trip is gonna be different than the time it takes to make that, meaning that the two waves are naturally going to interfere with each other. So we predict interference. Because since we're already moving in this direction, remember, the speed that light is traveling in this direction is gonna be different than the speed of light in that direction. The videos that, that I'll send you links for have some cool animations here. So we predict interference if there is an ether. And any guess what they found? They didn't find any interference. They found that the two beams of light perfectly came back to the same phase when they rejoined each other. So they found no ether. And again, this wasn't actually what they set out to do, uh, which was, I think, quite interesting. But they set the groundwork for Einstein because all of a sudden, once we realized that actually there is no preferred frame of reference, which is really what the outcome of this experiment meant. If there's no frame of reference, then when we start viewing the other laws of physics through different lenses, we see that actually, if we don't have a preferred frame of reference, Galilean transformations aren't necessarily correct. We can do other weird things with space and time if, we, if we're not required to have some like arbitrary reference frame that we always need to be going back to with Galilean transformations uh, uh, specifically. Um, so I, I, this just sound a little bit foggy here, but I think as we put it together, it'll make sense. So I'm gonna pause it one more time here, but this is the ultimate like layout of the Michelson-Morley experiment at which they did not discover the ether existed.